In this second uh, video about research design, we're going to talk about uh, coming up with alternative explanations and identifying the dependent variable a little bit better and the independent variables of the alternative explanations. So a lot of times people act as if the dependent variable, the outcome that they're trying to explain is somehow obvious uh, or God-given. It's not, right? It's like any other variable. A variable is a part of a theory. It's a social construction, right? So how we define it, how we measure it, is very important and often very problematic. It's not altogether obvious. So a lot of times people spend uh, a lot of effort on defining and measuring the independent variables and they don't put sufficient effort into thinking about what actually is the outcome that I'm trying to explain. How do I measure it? Does it, uh, will I divide it into different quantities or different types or subtypes? Uh, what is it exactly that I'm trying to explain, right? Uh, and then uh, after we've figured out what it is and how we're going to measure it, which type of variables, uh, nominal, ordinal, uh, I talked about that in the, in the video about concepts and measures, then we can turn to the alternative explanations, the alternative theories that might explain the outcome of the case, and what are their independent variables, and how are we going to measure them, and uh, how do we conceptualize them, right? Now, there are some ways to think about how can I be sure that I'm, uh, I have an adequate range or list of alternative explanations. Uh, one is we should check for potential endogeneity. Endogeneity is a general term for uh, having left out some uh, variable or, or, or mechanism or process, uh, but here I'm, I'm focusing mostly on the form of endogeneity where it's not clear you know, what the causal direction is. Does A cause B or does B cause A? So you can just try to think, you know, if I was claiming that arms races cause war, I might turn it around and ask, is there any way that wars or the sense that a war is coming actually is what's causing the arms race? Or might it be both or sometimes it's mostly one or sometimes the other? So we might think about that question. We might also ask as to whether we've considered both structural explanations and agent-based explanations. Structural explanations are things that have to do with uh, structures that go beyond individuals, so uh, governments, institutions, rules, norms. Uh, these are all kinds of structures. Uh, and agent-based explanations have to do with individual agents, or it could be other units, or it could be agents. Countries could be agents in a sense. Uh, but there we're looking to variation among agents to explain outcomes rather than variation in structures to explain outcomes. We can also ask whether we've anticipated potential kinds of complexity. Path dependency, where the order in which things happens matters to the ultimate outcome. Uh, Nonlinear relationships, uh, where maybe something has a small effect on the outcome until suddenly it reaches some threshold and then there's a big effect, or maybe it has a big effect but then it diminishes over time. We might have lagged or lead effects, uh, especially in human affairs where people are anticipating things and that's driving their behavior. It may be, there may be self-fulfilling prophecies where I worry or hope that something's going to happen and then my behavior makes it happen. Or there might be self-denying prophecies where I worry that something's going to happen and then I take action so that it doesn't happen, right? There can be learning effects where I change my behavior over time in response to lessons I draw from earlier cases. There can be high order interaction effects where the effect of any one variable depends on the values of the other variables. So these are all kinds of complexity we might think about. Now this slide, there's a lot going on here. Uh, let me unpack it for you. Uh, I think this is a very useful table to check on whether you've thought adequately about whole categories of theories that might apply to explaining your cases or your phenomena. And a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek, I call this my theory of everything. It's really a taxonomy of theories. It's different categories or families of theories about social causal mechanisms, okay? So I'm not going to go into every box here in equal detail. There's a lot here, but let me just explain sort of the organization of this table. Uh, first of all, the columns are three forms of explanation that are common in political science and sociology and economics. Uh, and these are uh, explanations having to do with legitimacy or ideas or norms or values. 
That's one form of explanation. Cultures might be under that too. A second form of explanation has to do with material power, material resources, capabilities, capacities of different actors or distributions in different structures. And the third one has to do with functional efficiency, ways of organizing institutions, rules, markets, economies, regulations, whatever, that are functionally efficient for some purpose uh, that actors have. Okay, so those are our three columns. In my own subfield of international relations, we, uh, we call the focus on legitimacy goes under the school of thought of constructivism, which focuses on the social construction and mutual constitution of agents and structures. Uh, material power in my subfield, we call that the realist school of thought, focuses on material power and the balance of power. And functional efficiency is the focus of the neoliberal school of thought, which focuses on uh, institutions and uh, ways that cooperation can emerge uh, under institutions. The, the, the logics of these, the logic of legitimacy is the, what we call the logic of appropriateness, the logic of uh, naming and shaming of social relations, whereas the material power and functional efficiency explanations have to do with what we call the logic of consequences, you know, uh, material costs and benefits to certain courses of action, right? That's the columns. The rows are different aspects of agent structure relations. First, we have agent to agent, where agents are interacting directly, like you and I are sort of indirectly through this video, but also at least somewhat directly, or at least in one direction from me to you. Uh, there's structure to agent. How does the structure constrain the actions of the agent? How does the social structure make some things, uh, it, also, it, it also enables, it makes some things possible, it makes some things difficult or even impossible. Uh, how does the agent relate to the structure? Agents are trying to shape and change structure. They might try to be creating revolutions, for example. And then there's structure to structure theories, mechanisms, relationships. These are a little bit harder to think of, but one example would be demographic structure, right? Uh, every society has a demographic structure. People are different ages, for example. People don't choose to get older, but they get older whether they choose to or not. And as people get older, the demographic structure of society changes, right? So we have three columns and four rows. So we have 12 different whole families of theories or explanations. And one thing you can do with your puzzle is ask which of these 12 theories or explanations might apply to explaining the outcome of my puzzle. 12 is too many to take up in any research design. Uh, and you could probably set aside some very quickly, either because they just don't seem logically to apply or because the evidence suggests they don't apply. Uh, but it's a good checklist to at least start out with a broad list of possible explanations to make sure you haven't left anything out. Let me give an example. I first developed this, uh, this taxonomy in a book that Jeff Chekel edited about, um, about transnational actors and civil and ethnic conflict. And I was asked to, to read a lot of the chapters and to make some general conclusions about how they use theories about causal mechanisms. Well, one of the chapters was about child soldiers, right? The use of child soldiers in ethnic and civil conflict. And when you think about that, you know, it seems like such a, a terrible, horrible, abhorrent, repulsive practice that your, your eyes immediately go to that legitimacy column and you think of ways that you can delegitimize it, but it's already illegitimate in, a lot of, in the view of a lot of actors. So you should also ask, you know, what's the functional efficiency dimension of child soldiering? If, if you don't think of the functional reasons that actors turn to child soldiers, you might not be as effective in getting rid of that practice. So is it that you know, ch children uh, eat less than adults so they're easier to maintain as soldiers? Is it because they can be more easily indoctrinated so they're less fearful in battle? Is it because the weapons that you're using, even a child can operate? You know, what is it? And if you don't think about that dimension of child soldiering, you, you don't understand the full picture. And in fact, after I offered that suggestion to the authors of that chapter, uh, a year or two later, uh, uh, Chris Blattman and a co-author published an article in International Organization, one of the best journals in the field, about the functional efficiency dimension of child soldiering. So these authors in the book had missed an opportunity to you know, be one of the first in, in publishing on that question. So uh, think about each of these possible categories of explanation for your problem. Make sure you're not leaving something out. 
I think is often a bigger problem if you leave out a potential explanation than if you use a little time looking into one that you then are able to set aside or just put in a footnote instead of spending lots of time on it. Because if you send an article to a reviewer and they say, wait, here's a big explanation you've left out, that's probably going to kill your chances of getting published. Okay, I'm not going to go into all of these, but just let's just, just as an example, let's look at the agent to agent row here. Uh, agents try to uh, emulate other agents who they think are legitimate or worthy of, of, uh, of imitating. They might also socialize other agents by articulating certain values. Uh, with material power, they might uh, incentivize, uh, at least acting as if you would have adopted certain ideas or practices. We call this hegemonic socialization. An example is an article by uh, Charlie Kupchin and John Eikenberry, where they talk about how the U.S. socialized other countries to take up certain ideas about how the world economy should work after World War II. Functional efficiency, agents see other agents that are success, successful, other actors that are successful, and then they imitate what they're doing, right? So these are three kinds of uh, explanations of agent-to-agent -agent relationships. So look through that table, think about how each of these might apply to your question or your puzzle. Make sure you're not leaving out a major alternative explanation. Okay, as I said, we want to cast the net widely for alternative explanations, at least at the start of our research. Uh, we want to err on the side of maybe including too many explanations at the start, and then we can winnow it down uh, as we proceed in our research. We also want to be fair to the alternative explanations. A lot of times I'll see research where somebody clearly has a favorite explanation and uh, then the other alternatives that they're not so interested in. And so for the alternative explanations, they look sort of very quickly for evidence. If it's not there, they're done. And for their favorite one, if they look quickly and there's not evidence for it, well, then they're going to look harder. And if there's not evidence, they'll look harder. Eventually, they're going to find some evidence that supports that explanation. Well, obviously, you've just introduced a whole lot of confirmation bias if you're not being equally diligent in, in tracking down the observable implications of all of the alternative explanations. We'll come back to that when we talk about process tracing. Okay, uh, and we'll also see the Bayesian rationale for why I give you this kind of advice. All right, so that's some uh, ideas about how we think about theorizing about our phenomena how we come up with some alternative, alternative explanations and check whether we're being adequate in our theorizing. For the second exercise on research design, I want you to take those questions that you developed in the first exercise and now ask yourself, what are some alternative explanations for the outcomes uh, on that question that I raised? Uh, and what are some of the variables that would be uh, involved in those alternative explanations. And then you can write those into the Google Doc if you're taking a class with me or just puzzle through those questions on your own uh, if you're going through the videos that way. Okay.